It is therefore time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of the Environment committed to funding a health study to understand the localized impact of air pollution on Sarnia residents. And Thank you for the government to finally recognize the request from the member for Sarnia Lambton. But I want to make sure this isn't just another Liberal announcement. I, I would like to know if there's a timeline for this study. We need to see a clear commitment. Mr. Speaker, when can the residents of Sarnia expect the study to start, and what was the timeline going to be for results? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I know that the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change will, uh, will want to speak to more of the specifics. But let me just say, Mr. Speaker, that we are absolutely committed to uh, getting this study started. It, uh, it makes perfect sense, Mr. Speaker, that we would that we would undertake this with experts, Mr. Speaker. Communities like uh, Sarnia have been directly impacted by uh, industry over the years, and we need to make sure that we do everything we can to understand exactly what the challenges are, Mr. Speaker, and to understand what the mitigations must be. So I will ask the Minister of Environment Change to speak to the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. But we are committed to doing this, and we are committed to starting immediately. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. Uh, and the Premier said she is absolutely committed to funding this, and that's good that that's finally happened. But since 2008, people have called for a study on this environmental concern. For nine years, studies have been stalled by this government. In fact, the Lambton Community Health Study got as far as a third planned phase. Industry in Sarnia stepped up, offering $1.4 million, but the requests made for similar funding for the province got rejected. Shame. This government refused for nine years. So I'd like to know specifically from the Premier, why did it take this media exposure, why did it take Global TV to finally get the government to accept the request right. from the member of Sarnia Lampton? <laughs> Thank you. Premier. Environment and climate change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'm delighted to be able to uh, address this uh, this concern and and the and things that uh, that I heard uh, and experienced when I uh, was in Sarnia last to meet with uh, First Nations folks and and in fact stopped in to uh, to meet with the local MPP for uh, for that riding to talk about uh, concerns of the community. Uh, you know, Speaker. You know, every Ontarian, I'll start with the fundamentals. As I said yesterday, every Ontarian deserves uh, fresh air to breathe, clean water to drink, and good land, clean land to walk upon. That is a fundamental uh, foundation, uh, building block of uh, vibrant communities. Uh, but you know, we know that, uh, that at times uh, the balance between the different needs of business and the environment, you know, they've tilted one way or the other. Communities like Sarnia have been directly impacted by this, uh, uh, Minister, uh, Speaker, and I know, uh, I know that uh, building uh, on previous regulations to lower air pollution, we're committed, as I said, as the Premier said Thank earlier, you. we're committed Thank you. Final supplementary. The member from Sarnia Lampton. Thank you. Well, back to the Premier, uh, Mr. Speaker. For nine years, this government's ignored the health concerns of the people of Sarnia Lampton. There was nothing but shocking indifference from the Liberals. Premier, I personally raised this issue with your government in 2008 and 2010. They've now committed to the study only after being publicly embarrassed. The fact it took nine years to commit to this study still leaves me and the community with concerns. Saying they are doing the study will still leave me with concerns. Saying they're doing the study is one thing. Committing and introducing a timeline is another. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier release the study's timeline today? Here, here. Here. Minister. You see the first? You see the first? Thank you. <laughs> Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. You know, as the Premier has said, as I've said, we're committed to funding a health study to, to understand the localized impact of air pollution on Sarnia residents. We're going to be working with those communities uh, in the coming weeks to determine how best to do that. We have to get a formal proposal put in front of us, Mr. Speaker, one that's updated in order to respond to it. But I'm going to say a couple of things, Speaker. You know, when the uh, Leader of the Opposition was in Ottawa with the Harper government, they refused to fund the study ten years ago. Start the 
clock. Order, please. Order, please. A member from the P and Carlton will come to order. Finish, please. Well, thank you, Speaker. I'll also say that when I was in Sarnia visiting with First Nations, I stopped in to see the MPP uh, for that area. We had a wonderful, casual conversation about what I've been hearing in the community, what he's been hearing in the community, and I'll say, Speaker, not once, not once was it raised with me that we need to study the health. No question. The Leader of the Opposition. No class ballot. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. For the second day, college students are not in class. It also happens to be midterm exams for many of them. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier allow students to miss their midterms, or will the Premier get both sides back to the bargaining table so we can get students back in the classroom? You know, I am very concerned about students not uh, being affected negatively by this situation, Mr. Speaker. Of course, I don't want students to lose this semester, Mr. Speaker. I want them in class. But, Mr. Speaker, I do believe that the collective bargaining process is one that has to be respected. Uh, we need to have the parties back at the table, Mr. Speaker. That is where the agreement is going to be finalized. And so, uh, both the minister and I have encouraged both sides to get back to the table, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that that conversation is fruitful and that they can come to an agreement. That's where the agreement has to take place, Mr. Speaker. I am very concerned about it. We are paying very close attention to it, and uh, I hope that in the very short future um, we will see that the parties are at the table and they yes, can sir. hammer out an agreement. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, when this government was campaigning, they promised no more labour disruptions, they promised labour peace, and students would be in the classroom. There have been three strikes at colleges over the last 50 years. In 1984, it was for 18 days. In 1989, it was for 20 days. In 2006, it went for 20 days once again. They promised us labour peace. You promised that students would be in the classroom. Chair. Students can't afford, Mr. Speaker, not to be in class. They can't afford to miss their midterms. And I know this is uncomfortable for the school. Order. Actually, both sides are disruptive. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, I get this is, un this is uncomfortable for the government. The labour peace they promised has not been realized. But I want to see students in the classroom. I want to see students back at colleges. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is is the Premier, is the Premier going to do everything she can to get both sides back to the bargaining Thank table? You. Stop, stop. You it, please? You it, please? Thank you. Premier. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I am, and so is the minister. We're going to do everything we can to get uh, both sides back to the bargaining table. And, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the history lesson from the leader of the opposition, <laughs> but he missed 1995 to 2003. <laughs> what happened in those years, Mr. Speaker? There were 26 million student days lost in this province. Hey. I think that high school kids and elementary school kids all over this province, Mr. Speaker, were out of school week after week after week because there was a government of the day that actually didn't support, didn't support the labour movement, didn't support collective bargaining, Mr. Speaker, and actually didn't believe Answer. in publicly funded education. Mr. Speaker, we'll do everything we can to get both sides back to the Thank table you. and make sure there's an agreement. Yeah. Thank you. Member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, come to order.
A uh, reminder to those uh, over on this side, I'm standing. <coughs> Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. When the Premier presented herself for public service, she said she was running to fight what she saw as school closures and labour disruptions. The reality is there is more school closures, and now we have labour disruptions, whether it's with physicians or educators. What this government has now become is what they said they were running against. And what this all comes down to, Mr. Speaker, is how does this affect students? Let me share with you a quote from a student in Thunder Bay. I was very concerned. I have a scholarship, and I'm just here for another month. If I lose classes, that might affect my scholarship. You've got a student worried about their academic year, and right now we have the government trying to blame others. Yesterday we had the Deputy Premier saying we can't get involved. Now today we have the Premier saying they will get involved. I want to know what this government's going to do to get students back in the classroom. Don't make us wait 20 days or 40 days. Students need to be in the classroom. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, look, my, my concern is for the students, Mr. Speaker, and that has always been my concern. You know, the, the Leader of the Opposition, um, in fact, misinterprets what uh, I have said about why I got into politics. Mr. Speaker, I got into politics because I believe so firmly in publicly funded education. And part of, part of publicly funded education, Mr. Speaker, is the reality that we have, we have labour unions, Mr. Speaker, we have federations, we have ongoing discussions among the partners in education. So, Mr. Speaker, will I do everything in my power to make sure that we encourage the parties to get back to the table? Yes, I will, Mr. Speaker. But will I undermine the collective bargaining process? Will I, uh, will I take actions? The member from Windsor West come to order. Wrap up, Premier. It is always an uncomfortable position for everyone and a very, very distressing situation when people are not able to go to their classes, Mr. Speaker. I know that the instructors and the teachers who are out, they don't want to be out either, Mr. Speaker. They want to be in the classroom Answer. with their students. We'll do everything we can to get everyone back to the member classroom. From to the Callan, come to order. Question, the member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Two weeks ago, we learned that Peterborough Regional Hospital is opening up 24 unfunded beds just to try and keep up with the number of people needing hospital care. Unfunded bed speakers are beds that are opening without any help from this Liberal government. According to the hospital, the money to operate those beds is being diverted from their reserve fund, a fund specifically earmarked for investment in capital and infrastructure. Does the Premier expect hospital, how does the Premier expect hospital to plan for their future when she's forcing them to use their saving just to meet their current operational needs? So, Mr. Speaker, I know that the minister is going to want to speak to the specifics of this situation, but let me just say that we have injected billions of new dollars into the health care system, including, Mr. Speaker, 500 million new dollars for hospitals as a result of our last budget, Mr. Speaker. I have a lot of faith in, uh, our, in our local health integration networks, in our hospital administrations, Mr. Speaker, as they look at the, at the specific situations in their communities and make decisions based on their circumstances. So, as I say, Mr. Speaker, I don't know the specifics of the decisions that have been made by the administration at the hospital in Peterborough. What I do know is that there are intelligent decisions being made around the province with the support of the government, with the support of new dollars, Mr. Speaker, to deal with the circumstances in each of those communities. And I think, Mr. Speaker, that uh, you know, it is our responsibility to continue to work with hospitals and other health care providers to make sure that they can make those decisions based on the interests of the people in their communities, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker. Opening up these 24 unfunded beds will cost Peterborough Hospital $1.8 million just this fiscal year. The hospital will need $4 million more year after year to keep those beds open. According to internal document that we at the NDP released today, occupancy rate in both mental health and acute care units have been consistently higher than what is considered safe. Will the Premier commit right now today to funding these additional beds so that the good people of Peterborough get the hospital care that they need? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I uh, congratulate Peterborough Hospital for the tremendous efforts that they're making, not only in providing the highest quality of care to the residents uh, in and around Peterborough, but for managing uh, their health system effectively. And in fact, this year alone, they were one of the hospitals in this province that received the biggest increase in their operating budget. So, of course, on average, we increased the hospital operating budget by 3.1 per cent this year, but Peterborough received a new injection to their base of $9.4 million, which represents a 4.3 increase in their operating budget. Mr. Speaker, it continues to amaze me that every effort that we make, whether it's through a budget that they've rejected Answer. or through the consideration of the Humber uh, Finch site project proposal for ALC yeah. for release of capacity challenges, that member Thank and that you. party continues to impose, oppose those efforts. Yeah. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The occupancy rate for Peterborough acute care beds reached 99 per cent in May of this year. Wow. Both the mental health and the acute care units are also operating unconventional beds, Speaker. You know what that is? That's a fancy word to mean that you admit people into hallway, into broom closet, into waiting room. Right. The list goes on. Right. With low privacy or human dignity. How can the Premier continue to turn a blind eye to the overcrowding, to the hallway medicine crisis in our province when hospital after hospital are at overcapacity? and Ontario family needing hospital care are paying the price. Thank you, Minister. Well, the member opposite knows that the vast majority of hospitals in this province operate well below capacity, Mr. Speaker, well, well less than the 100 per cent capacity. And, Mr. Speaker, we are making those investments, that half billion dollars that was referenced. In fact, in Peterborough just last Friday, an important announcement by the member from Peterborough of $2 million in brand-new capital for the creation of a new Peterborough Hospice, wow, Mr. Speaker, which is great news for that community, and it reflects the hard work that they're doing. But, Mr. Speaker, I have to go back again once more to the fact that in their tenure as government, they closed 24 per cent of all acute care beds in this province. They closed 13 per cent of the mental health beds. They closed a total which is only beaten by the Conservatives, yeah, which approached 10,000 in five years. New question. The member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier. Peterborough is not the only hospital struggling right now, and it is just not acute care that is overcrowded either. We at the NDP have released very shocking and disturbing internal statistics that shows mental health units are overcrowded in Sudbury, Kitchener, Oshawa, Etobicoke, Mississauga, Toronto, the list goes on, Speaker. Mental health care has been ignored and underfunded by this Liberal government for years now. How does the Premier expect frontline health care workers, particularly those who work in mental health, to provide the quality care that patients need when they are cons constantly understaffed and running off their feet. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are making unprecedented investments in mental health and addictions across this province. As recently as the spring budget, where we made and announced an $80 million investment that that member and that party voted against, Mr. Speaker, which represents cumulatively $140 million over three years, 
unprecedented first of its kind in the entire country a significant invest a, a significant investment mr speaker in cognitive behavioral therapy a form of interventional therapy which is highly proven as highly effective specifically particularly for individuals with uh, anxiety disorders with depression for example so we were the first and are the first in the country to actually fund that program we're funding Answer. more supportive housing we're funding youth wellness hubs all in the spring budget that that member voted thank against. you Supplementary. The Premier and her minister seem completely unconcerned with the large number of Ontario hospitals operating way above safe capacity. She seems completely unconcerned that people struggling with their mental health have access to only a few scattered services in overcrowded hospitals. How can the Premier look at these numbers? How can she hear those horror stories that go to her office and not realize Chief that Webb. the problem in our mental health system are real? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think one thing we can all agree is that we need to make more and greater investments in mental health. I've said repeatedly that we need to look at mental health services the same way we do physical health services. There are two sides of the same coin, and there's no health without mental health. But we are making those investments. This year's budget alone, again, $13 million in new funding for the specialty mental health hospitals. We made investments for 1,000 more supportive housing spaces. $48 million for specialized mental health services at St. Joseph's Care Group in Thunder Bay, $5 million to Youthdale Treatment Centre, a brand new inpatient mental health program and unit at Royal Victoria in Barrie, specific for children and youth, an Answer. inpatient unit and an outpatient unit, Georgian Bay Hospital, a new renovation for mental health that the member from Barrie announced just last week, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. From Burlington. A new, in Burlington, a new hospital, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The Ontario Hospital Association has called for immediate and ongoing funding just to make it through the flu season. OPSU, mental health care workers, some of them are with us today, are calling for more frontline staff. The Premier and her minister likes to tout her last budget in response to those serious questions, but even that budget shorts change our hospital by over $300 million. It seems to me, Speaker, that the Premier, her minister, her entire government are completely out of touch on this issue. Why won't this Liberal government stop playing politics with people's health, with people's access to care? Admit that there is an overcrowding and hallway medicine crisis in our hospital and do something right now to fix the mess they've created. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, once again, I don't deny that there aren't challenges in our health care system, but we need to be careful that we represent the system effectively and transparently and authentically, Mr. Speaker. We, we have the Fraser Institute, if you can believe it, that has consistently ranked Ontario's health care system as having some of the shortest wait times in Canada. The Wait Time Alliance has given us straight A's as well, Mr. Speaker. We've invested in the spring budget 11 $1.5 billion over the next three years into our health care system. I don't know how the member opposite can possibly characterize that as anything other than an unprecedented investment, which is even separate from the $20 billion in capital investment over the next 10 years in our system. But perhaps it's because she's reflecting upon their time in government where they made drastic cuts to the health care system, where Sir? they cut $20 million from our psychiatric hospitals, and they closed 13 per cent of all mental health beds in the province, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Tabled just minutes ago was another damning report by the Auditor General. The unfair hydro plan will cost up. Ontario up to $4 billion more than necessary. Four Billion. That means Ontario families will have to pay an additional $4 billion just for the Liberals' 
re-election campaign. Mr. Speaker, this scheme, the unfair hydro plan, is about one thing and only one thing, and that's the Liberals' re-election. It's not about paying hydro bills. It's not about helping Ontario families. This is just about the partisan interests of the Liberal Party of Ontario. The Auditor General makes that abundantly clear. So what I want to know, Mr. Speaker, from the Premier is how can she justify blowing $4 billion to help the Liberal Party? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I appreciate the work that the Auditor General has done. And, Mr. Speaker, you know, the reality is that families uh, across this province, individuals across this province, were saying that. The costs of their electricity prices Mr. Speaker, from Leeds, are going up too high, Mr. Speaker, and they're going up too quickly. Right after I asked him to come, he shows another one. The member from Leeds Grenville, second time. And the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, I have acknowledged many times in this legislature and outside this legislature that the investments that had to be made because we had a degraded electricity system in this province, Mr. Speaker, that we needed to rebuild, that there was a cost associated with that. I've been quite open about that, Mr. Speaker. Billion dollars were invested. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Oh, I knew. Well, Mr. Speaker, I hear heckling from the other side that this is partisan. This is not partisan. This is about people needing to have the reliability of turning on a light switch, Mr. Speaker, and the light coming on. In 2003, we had blackouts and brownouts. The lights weren't coming on, Mr. Speaker. We've rebuilt the system, and people needed a break. Please. Member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, start the clock. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. The way this government chose to do their unfair hydro plan cost Ontario families $4 billion. This That's is your decision. That's this is the path you picked. The Auditor General makes that unequivocally clear. It also confirms another thing, that the Liberal Party and the way they're doing this cooks the books. You know, you, you, you read the direct quotes. Mr. Speaker, this, this is a direct quote. They're making up their own accounting rules. Can you imagine that? A direct quote, making up your own accounting rules? She also unearthed the fact that ratepayers will be charged more than the actual cost of electricity being produced in order to pay back boring. This is cynical politics at its worst. Making up their, your own rules, charging Ontario families more to serve the partisan interests of the Liberal Party. Mr. Speaker, my question for the question. Premier is, why won't she just come clean and admit to Ontario families that she's blowing— I am uh, I'm not prepared to accept the terminology that was used, so I'll ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw, but a direct quote. You know, you know it doesn't matter because you can't say indirectly what you can't say directly. The, uh, the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation come to order. And this is the kind of thing that I'm not impressed with when we start doing personal comments, and it'll stop now. Premier. Minister of Energy. 
Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government thanks the Auditor General for her review of our plan to reduce electricity bills for all residential consumers by an average of 25 per cent. Mr. Speaker, families in this province have asked for real and immediate relief on their electricity bills, and that's why we have delivered, Mr. Speaker, the largest rate reduction in Ontario's history. Since 2003, nearly $70 billion have been invested in the electricity system, including more than $37 billion in electricity generation to ensure that our system is clean and reliable. Mr. Speaker, as we all are aware, the Auditor General's report is technical in nature, and I understand she will be discussing it with the media and members of the Legislature at 12 p.m. today. We've uh, also been addressing some of these points at the Standing Committee on es uh, Estimates, Mr. Speaker. So, in respecting the independence of the province's Answer. officers of the Legislature, including the Auditor General, our government will respond to the report following her Thank news you. conference. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Last May, the Financial Accountability Officer revealed that the Premier's so-called fair hydro plan will not reduce hydro costs, but merely postpone payment of those costs until after the next election. In the long run, Ontario families will pay billions more under the government scheme than they would have paid without that scheme. And today, the Auditor General revealed that the government is wasting, wasting $4 billion on an Enron-style accounting scheme whose sole purpose is to hide this truth from the public. Wow. Why is the Premier forcing Ontario consumers to pay $4 billion Question. just so she can mislead the public about her hydro borrowing scheme? Wow. No, 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 no. Yeah. You state it, please. The member will withdraw. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, and I know that the President of the Treasury Board is going to want to, uh, to comment, but let me just say again, Mr. Speaker, that we appreciate the work that the Auditor General has done, Mr. Speaker. Um, we recognize, and I have said, uh, I've said that. Uh, it was absolutely necessary, Mr. Speaker, to make the investments that, uh, that were made to rebuild a degraded electricity system, that there was a cost associated with those, Mr. Speaker, and that therefore the cost of electricity were going up quickly and they were going up uh, to a, a very high rate, particularly in some parts of the province and some of the rural and northern communities, Mr. Speaker. So we responded by putting in place a plan that, again, I have said publicly, we knew that over the long term was going to have a cost associated with it, Mr. Speaker. But we also know that the asset that has been built yes, and rebuilt, Mr. Speaker, uh, will last for a number of generations and that we spread that cost over a longer period of time. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, that was not a satisfactory answer. The Premier is spending $5.5 million in public money to tell Ontarians that hydro costs are going down when we know they're actually going up. And now the Auditor General has revealed that the Premier is forcing ratepayers to pay $4 billion in an Enron-style accounting scheme designed to conceal this truth from Ontarians. Instead of adding billions in needless costs onto the hydro bills of Ontario families, will the Premier finally admit that her misguided hydro borrowing scheme will make everyone worse off in the long run? Yes, thank you very much, Speaker. And you know, when I think back to 2003, and I think of my own uh, riding of Guelph, I think about a uh, part of Ontario that never used to have smog days. The reason we had smog days was because of coal generation. We have invested a lot of money into the Ontario hydro system to make sure we get rid of coal-fired generation. And you know what? We don't. Finish, please. 
But we also know that consumers have been struggling with the cost of electricity bills, and that is why we brought in the Fair Hydro Plan, is to reduce the cost of hydro for, our, for, for people throughout Ontario, for average families. What we uh, also know is that the auditor has tabled her fair hydro yes, part sir. today. We appreciate her work. We uh, will uh, respect the auditor going forward with Thank her you. conference at noon. We will. No question, the member for Beaches East Shore. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Research, Innovation, and Science. Now, Speaker, I understand the minister was recently in Quebec with a number of his colleagues to strengthen Ontario and Quebec relations. And it's my further understanding that the visit went very, very well, was quite successful. Now, Speaker, more than ever, it is important for all provinces to come together, collaborate and share initiatives and innovative ideas that will improve the lives of Ontarians and Canadians. And during the visit, Speaker, I understand the minister signed a memorandum of understanding for Ontario-Quebec collaboration on artificial intelligence. Speaker. Could the minister tell the members of this legislature a little bit more about the memorandum of understanding that was signed and how we are promoting the development of artificial intelligence in the province of Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Research, Innovation thank and you, Science. Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure my colleagues have heard me say this time and time again that the key to innovation is collaboration. Yeah. And that is exactly why I was in Quebec City signing a memorandum of understanding with Mr. Anglade of the Quebec government. Yeah. Uh, this MOU, Mr. Speaker, with Quebec will allow each province to build on its existing strengths in the field of artificial intelligence and the multi-sector collaboration. Ontario and Quebec, Mr. Speaker, are being presented with an incredible opportunity uh, to work together in creating expertise in the field of artificial intelligence, expertise that will keep both jurisdictions competitive around the globe for the years to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very good. Thank you, Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, of course, to the Minister for his answer and for the great leadership he's showing on building capacity in artificial intelligence. Ontario, Speaker, is well regarded as a leading jurisdiction in AI research. Now, last week I read that the Minister signed another memorandum of understanding between Ontario and the British High Commission in Ottawa. And I'm pleased to see the Minister is doing everything in his power to build these important relationships with other jurisdictions around the world. And as I said earlier, it's a time when the world is increasingly becoming closed off and isolationist. And it's wonderful to see that this government and our representatives are pushing for collaboration on issues of importance to all Canadians. So, Speaker, could the minister please elaborate on the memorandum of understanding that was signed with the British High Commission? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank uh, my colleague for, for that question, as well as I want to uh, thank him for sharing uh, my opinion on collaboration as key for innovation, Mr. Speaker. Last week, I signed a memorandum of understanding with the British High Commissioner to enhance and strengthen our efforts to pursue common goals in the field of transformative technologies. Wow. Wow. Mr. Speaker, past investments by the Government of Ontario in transformative technologies include $130 million wow. for next generation network, $80 million for automotive uh, vehicles. $50 million for Vector Institute for Artificial wow. Intelligence, $50 million for Perimeter Institute for Fundamental Physics, and $20 million for Quantum Value Ideas Lab. Collaboration between Ontario and the UK, Mr. Speaker, will yield sustained economic Sir. relations, encourage industrial relations, foster research and development, and help us both harness best scientific practices, thank you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks, Speaker, uh, and thanks to the Auditor General for her report today. We know that the Premier and the Liberal government blew a billion dollars in the gas plant scandal to get re-elected. Now we know that they're going to double down as a result of the report. They're not even going to double down, Mr. Speaker. They're quadrupling down today, a $4 billion Stop, scandal. Stop. First of all, I need to know who, I'll ask you in a moment, and uh, the, the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services will come to order, and the President of the Treasury Board will come to order. The Premier speaks. Thank you. We know that the Premier was responsible for the billion-dollar scandal uh, with the gas plants. We now know that this scandal that's been uncovered today by the uh, Auditor General is a $4 billion scandal. This government is doubling down, it's quadrupling down, using taxpayers' dollars for its re-election ploy. 
And if the Auditor General's report isn't scathing enough, we have a report from the Financial Post this morning that released stats on the loss of manufacturing jobs as a result of the Green Energy Act, which got us into this mess in the first place. The report states Question. that we have lost 75,000 jobs in Ontario in the manufacturing sector, a direct result. Why is the Premier continuing to defend this policy? <laughs> Data, Premier. Question. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Mr. Speaker, I just came from the Canadian Manufacturer and Exporters Annual General Meeting, and Mr. Speaker, I can tell you one thing. Our exporters, our manufacturers are tired of opposition members talking down the incredible progress they have made working through the global recession, Mr. Speaker. Emerging stronger here in this province, creating 12,000 net jobs in the manufacturing sector alone in the last year alone. It's not fair, Mr. Speaker, to talk down that hardworking sector, leading the country in growth, helping us create 800,000 net new jobs, Mr. Speaker, across this province. It's time for that party to start su supporting our manufacturers, Mr. Speaker, rather than denigrating them. Thank you. The member from Simcoe Gray will come to order. Please. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. We're getting a very, very different story on this side of the House when it comes to job losses in Ontario and companies that are hanging on by a thread in Ontario because of the policies of this government. The Green Energy Act in this study done by the Financial Post shows shows that 75,000 manufacturing jobs left Ontario as a result, a direct result, of the Green Energy Act. It's a mess, Mr. Speaker. It's a mess for our employers over there. It's a mess for our manufacturers. And the Auditor General has pointed out today that this government is willing to blow another $4 billion. That's $800 per household in Ontario for their re-election platform. It's unheard of, it's disrespectful, and it has to stop. But there's no sign of it stopping. They got away with it once with the gas plants. They're going to do four times the damage with this unfair Liberal Hydro plan. Okay. Will they stop it now? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, where was the opposition? When we put, when we we invested 1.9 billion dollars in our manufacturing sector to leverage 18 billion dollars in private sector investment and support 90,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker, they were nowhere. They were opposing those investments. Where was the opposition when we were reducing regulatory burden on the manufacturing sector? When we brought in the industrial exemption, Mr. Speaker, they were absolutely silent. Where was the opposition, Mr. Speaker, when our finance minister provided? some pension solvency relief to this sector, saving them hundreds of millions of dollars. Where were they, Mr. Speaker, when we brought in the Smart Green program run by our Canadian manufacturers and experts? Nowhere, Mr. Speaker. Where were they when we brought in three different initiatives in the ICI, the Industrial Conservation Initiative, Answer. to save our manufacturers billions of dollars, Mr. Speaker? Nowhere, Mr. Speaker. They're all talk, no action. We stand up for our manufacturing sector, Thank you. and that's why this province is up. Thank you. Your question, the member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. On Friday, an Ontario Superior Court approved a motion permitting Sears Canada to shut down operations, leaving 12,000 people with no job and no severance, and thousands of pensioners with a total pension shortfall of more than $260 million. This will have a devastating impact on families in my community of Oshawa and across the province that have worked their whole lives counting on their pension being there when they retire. And last year, I introduced a motion to ensure that pensioners are given top priority ahead of large corporations during bankruptcy proceedings. This government supported my motion unanimously, but I guess they've changed their mind or gone back on their word. Will the Premier do the right thing, honour the commitment she made, and stand up for Ontario's pensioners? 
So, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance is going to uh, to speak to the specifics of the, the financial situation. But let me let me just first say that it is uh, it is obviously very very hard on families when uh, a business of this magnitude shuts down, Mr. Speaker. Um, I you know my heart goes out to all of the people who are affected. We are working with the situation, Mr. Speaker. We're working with uh, with all of the players, and we will do everything that we can. But, Mr. Speaker, in the first instance. Instance. The the economy is shifting. There's no doubt about that. And you know, there was just a, a lively exchange with the Minister of Economic Development and Growth and the opposition. The reality is that the, the nature of our economy is changing. Jobs are changing. There are jobs coming to Ontario. There are new jobs that are opening. We we talked about an investment in artificial intelligence, Mr. Speaker. But there Thanks, are sir. jobs. There are jobs that are uh, are no longer, Mr. Speaker, because of the nature of the economy, the nature Thank of you. retail, the nature of work, Mr. Speaker. But my heart goes out to the families who are affected. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And again to the Premier. Um, it's lovely that her heart goes out to them, but we hope that help would go out to them as well. For pensioners, this isn't just an outstanding debt on a balance sheet. It's about keeping food on the table and a roof over their families. New Democrats have called for any revenue from liquidation sales to be used to fund Sears employees' pensions first, not more executive bonuses. And we'll continue to fight for laws that make this the case for all workers. Does the Premier think that big corporations and executive bonuses should be the priority over pensioners? Minister of Finance. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question and, and the concern. And I know that members of the uh, Canadian Federation of Pensioners are here today. One of them is a pensioner from Sears who's being affected by it as we speak today. And only in Ontario will he have the benefit of a pension guaranteed fund. Nowhere else in Canada is that available. <laughs> Furthermore, we are looking at making reforms to provide even greater support for pensioners going forward. And those are some of the reforms we put, put forward. I know the member opposite is talking about the changes that should be enacted by the laws of Canada, and we recognize that and support that. But right now, we need to help the pensioners today as it affects them today, and we are doing just that by the reforms we're making, working alongside the members of the pensioners and knowing that we must do our utmost to protect those pensions. And I can assure the members of Sears that over 80 to 90 percent of them will get their full pension because of Ontario's guarantee. Answer. And furthermore, their pension assets are not affected by the bankruptcy, and we'll fight for them all the way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, as you may know, today marks the second day of Waste Reduction Week in Canada. And over the course of this week, Canada's, Canada will, Canadians will be holding events to challenge themselves and encourage others to reduce waste. And just to be clear, Speaker, we're talking about solid waste, not time. Speaker, uh, in 2014 alone, 11.5 million tons was, of waste was generated in the province of Ontario. And that means, on average, every person in Ontario generated approximately one ton of waste per year. The events this week serve as opportunities for Ontarians to learn how they can reduce waste in their homes and communities and businesses. And through the Waste Free Ontario Act, we are making it easier for Ontarians to do just that. Speaker, in recognition of Waste Reduction Week, can the minister please explain to this House what the government is doing to help Ontarians Question. reduce waste? Thank you. Minister of uh, Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to, uh, to the member for that uh, very important question. You know, uh, we're happy here to recognize uh, Waste Reduction Week uh, today. It really is an opportunity for all Ontarians to take the challenge to reduce waste in their daily lives. As a member mentioned, Ontario generates millions of tons of waste each year. Currently, Speaker, only 28 per cent of that waste is being diverted from landfills. The result is <clears throat> this results in $1 billion in valuable resources lost each year to landfill. However, it's estimated that for every 1,000 tons of waste diverted from landfill, we could create seven jobs, $360,000 in wages, and $700,000 in additional GDP. Speaker, our government recognizes the value of reinvesting these Answer. resources in the economy. Speaker, that's why we took action by introducing the Waste Free Ontario Act, so that Ontarians could be proud of the work being done to reduce waste across the province. 
Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the minister for his uh, response. And, Speaker, as you will know, that climate change is, of course, becoming an increasingly apparent global threat. We also know that managing waste and reusing uh, our resources is a critical part of achieving our goals to re reduce greenhouse gas emissions and moving towards a prosperous, low-carbon economy. Our Climate Change Action Plan commits to reducing emissions from waste and moving Ontario towards a circular economy. We recognize that diverting waste from landfill is not just about protecting our land environment, it is also speaker central to fighting climate change and creating a better future for Ontarians and our planet. That's why we're transitioning towards this circular economy. Reusing and reinvesting resources allows us to keep resources within the economy, benefiting both the environment and the economic product productivity of Ontarians. Question. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how the circular economy will improve Ontario's economy and the lives of Ontarians? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you to uh, the member for uh, Tobacco North for that, uh, that follow-up question, Speaker. You know, uh, our government is committed to moving uh, beyond the linear uh, make, use, dispose of model to a new model that we refer to as the circular economy, where we make productive use of materials for as long as possible. We're also lowering the cost of recycling for Ontarians and providing them with more convenient recycling options. By increasing, uh, significantly increasing uh, diversion efforts, Ontario will be su supporting 13,000 jobs and adding $1.5 billion to the province's GDP. We've also committed, Speaker, to reducing emissions of greenhouse gases from landfills, which account for about 5 per cent of our total greenhouse gas emissions here in Ontario. However, not everyone has joined the movement to reduce waste here in Ontario. Uh, in fact, the yes, members sir. of both parties opposite Speaker voted against the Waste Free Ontario Act in 2016. Uh, during Waste Reduction Week, Speaker, I urge all members Thank you. to consider waste reduction. No question. The member from dufferin caledon Minister of Infrastructure. Today, OPSU members join us at Queen's Park to highlight the important issue of mental health in the workplace. I'd like to highlight one of your so-called state-of-the-art provincial facilities, a facility that itself has been used as a weapon. One resident made a homemade sword out of the wall at Waypoint Centre. The provincial investigator found that, quote, the patient was able to destroy their room to the point of accessing metal supports from behind the drywall including the removal of a towel rack, and proceeded to construct weapons out of these materials. No worker in this province should fear being attacked by homemade weaponry in any provincial facility, let alone homemade weaponry fashioned from the facility itself. Can the minister explain how the government allowed this to happen? Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Labour, Speaker. Mr. Labour. Speaker, and thank you to the member for this very, very important question. And Speaker, as we learn more about mental health in our society, some of the treatments have to be provided in secure facilities, Speaker. And we trust the care of those individuals to some of the people that have joined us here today, some of the people that have joined us for breakfast this morning from OPSU, Speaker. And let me tell you, I've visited Waypoint myself personally. I plan to return in the fall. Some of the things we were hearing, some of the complaints we were hearing out of the institution, Speaker, were ones that we didn't want to hear at the Ministry of Labour. We sent our inspectors in. We realized there was some changes that needed to be made, Speaker. What I have done is I've talked to the heads of all four hospitals in the province, Speaker, CAMH, Brockville, Ottawa, and Waypoint. What I've asked them to do, what I've asked Waypoint specifically to do, is to come back with a plan that deals with these issues, Speaker. Once that plan is in place, Answer. I understand it will be very shortly. I will return to Waypoint, Speaker, and take a look at the facility myself. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Minister of Infrastructure. Frontline workers know that the Minister has not done enough. The Ministry failed to provide a facility that would keep our workers safe. Our frontline workers and our nurses are not being put first by this government. This government is prioritizing the interests of Liberal insiders over the best interests of Ontario. Will the minister promise that any facility will be put, putting people first, not a Liberal insiders? Thank you. Minister. thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the follow-up, and thank you for the concern, Speaker, because 
Nobody should go to work in the province of Ontario, Speaker, no matter what job they do. Nobody should go to work in the province of Ontario thinking that they may be in danger. There's some unique hazards that are um, associated with these institutions, with this environment, Speaker. In the past, it was accepted for our nurses, for people that looked after patients in these facilities. It was accepted that there would be a certain risk. There was a tolerance to that risk. There was almost an expectation you would get hurt. Speaker, that is simply not good enough. It's not good enough for me. It's not good enough for the Ministry of Labor. It's not good enough for this government, Speaker. We're working towards rectifying some of the people that have come forward today, Speaker. They are right. They're telling us about things that need to be corrected. We should be proud of the work we've done to date, yes, not satisfied, but proud of the progress we've made to date on this issue. Thank you. No question. The member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Yes, Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Yesterday, we heard the Minister promise a study on air pollution for Chemical Valley. Unfortunately, his government promised a similar study back in 2009, and it remains nowhere to be seen. The government also promised to update its sulfur dioxide st standard by the end of 2016. The current standard dates back to 1970s and is nearly four times higher than the Canadian ambient air quality standard. Sulfur dioxide has been blamed for increased rates of asthma and other health problems in South Sarnia and Amjanong First Nation. Is it now? It's now. 2017. Why has the minister failed to implement the new standards? Good question. Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for uh, for that uh, very important question because we do know that sulfur dioxide, SO2, is, uh, is not something that, uh, that in any concentration above about 40 parts per billion, uh, Ontarians should be breathing on a regular basis. So that's, that's why we continue to emphasize, Speaker, that clean air is critical for human health uh, and to the environment. You know, Speaker, I want to say that, that Ontario's actions have improved significantly air quality across Ontario over the past 10 years, uh, with, with significant decreases in harmful pollutants like nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, fine particulate matter, sulfur dioxide. I mean, it's, uh, the closing of coal plants is one of the main reasons we don't have the smog across much of southern Ontario uh, and all of the ensuing uh, positive benefit, uh, health benefits that yes, come for that. So, Speaker, uh, we are looking at uh, SO2 standards, new SO2 standards. Supplementary. Again to the minister, flaring is a relatively common occurrence in Chemical Valley. When sour gas is flared, it releases sulfur dioxide. Unregulated flaring, along with the weak sulfur dioxide standard, is putting the health of Sarnia and Amjanong families at risk. The Amjanong First Nation, the Anishinaabek Nation Grand Council, and the Assembly of First Nations have all called on the minister to update the sulfur dioxide standards. The government promised a new standard by the end of 2016. This government broke their promise. When will the minister stop breaking this promise and finally update the sulfur dioxide standards? Thank you. Sir. Well, thank you, Speaker. And again, uh, a very important question when it comes to uh, air quality here in Ontario and all of the, the positive things that, uh, that this ministry, this government has been doing to reduce uh, uh, particulate uh, matter and sulfur dioxide uh, matters uh, across uh, Ontario. In fact, Speaker, you know, Sarnia itself has seen some substantial reductions in emissions in just recent years. Sulfur dioxide has been reduced by 64 percent. Nitrogen dioxide has been reduced by 23 percent particulate matter has been reduced by 43 percent so clearly speaker there's a lot of good things going on in Sarnia but we need to do more not only in Sarnia but right across Ontario not only with sulfur dioxide but with any chemical that is admitted by uh, by industry well, speaker we're on it we're going to get this done and sir thank you new question the member from Barry thank you speaker my question is for the Minister of International Trade our government, through its foresight and prioritization of building relations with the world's established and emergent global markets, created a dedicated ministry for international trade. The ministry has worked hard to firmly establish its roots and has placed great emphasis on diversification. Just as diversity is a staple of our culture in Ontario, 
It, too, has become a characteristic of the way in which we do trade. That's right. Upon the minister's return from trade missions, I'm always amazed to hear not only of the significant amount and scale of agreements being generated, but also the overwhelming interest in the growing amount of sectors that Ontario businesses have spanned. Speaker, can the minister elaborate on the importance of trade diversification and the implications Question. it will have for Ontarians? Minister of International Trade. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for asking the question. Speaker, the member is correct. Our ministry recognizes the need for diversification and its important role in enhancing our economic success. We focus on diversification through two-pronged approach. Speaker, first, we must diversify our markets. Currently, we have free trade agreement with EU, NAFTA, and South Korea, among others. Speaker, Canada is also in exploratory discussions with India, China, Japan. With these agreements in place, Canada will have preferential market access to over 1.2 billion customers. Secondly, Speaker, we must diversify the types of goods and services we wish to export. Sectors such as clean tech, AI, e-commerce, med tech, financial technology are reshaping the business landscape. Speaker, in broadening our trade Thank horizons, you. we are both ready. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, it's wonderful to hear that the ministry's strategic plan to engage diverse markets is inclusive of all sectors and regions that contribute to the economic growth of our province. Diversity in trade means nobody is left behind, no business, no sector, and no riding. This week, we are celebrating small businesses. Small and medium-sized enterprises make up 99 per cent of Canadian businesses and thus supporting SMEs to, is in, integral to our economic prosperity. Through Small Business Week, I continue to learn more about our government's efforts to support and help develop Ontario's small industries. I am curious to learn of the contributions which the Ministry of International Trade makes to the overall growth of our SMEs. Question. Speaker, could the ministry kindly expand on the array of supports his ministry provides to new and potential exporters looking to engage with the world's emerging markets? Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Barrie for her advocacy. Speaker, new and potential exporter can find the notion of engaging in export opportunities overwhelming. However, our ministry has implemented effective and reliable support to ease this process. Our ministry has stationed international trade and investment officers in 15 key markets, such as Mexico, the EU, China, Japan, India, and others, that work to enhance Ontario's businesses internationally. As part of Ontario's international operations, we also have strategically placed in market trade development representatives in priority markets like Chile, the Gulf region, and Southeast Asia. Yes, sir. We encourage business owners across Ontario to contact our ministry to contact our ministry to find out how they can take advantage of these resources. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Minister, excuse me, the Speaker, the uh, Minister of Transportation. Ontario's drive test licensing services are governed by a ministry oversight program that expects 90 per cent of customers to spend 20 minutes or less waiting for the testing services all motorists require. Will the minister tell us the average wait time Ontario motorists are currently forced to endure in lines winding out the doors of our provincial drive test centres? Good question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I appreciate the question from the member. Uh, there are drive test centres, as he's pointed out, in every corner of the province of Ontario, and he is, uh, he is right if I heard correctly in what he said uh, with respect to uh, the, the standard that exists uh, for those drive test centres. I know that there are a number of communities, for example, Speaker, in the Brampton area is one example, uh, where there are some challenges with some of the wait times that exist. I also know, and I've said this to media over the last number of weeks that have asked this question, uh, that the Ministry of Transportation is working with our contractor uh, to, uh, to provide the service level that is uh, expected in the contract and, uh, frankly, Speaker, is expected and deserved by the people who are using our drive test centres. And I expect over the next few weeks that I will have an update to provide 
uh, with respect to this specific issue. But again, I do appreciate the member asking the question and uh, hope to have an update relatively soon with respect to some of the improvements or enhancements that we anticipate that we'll be making to the system. Thanks Thank very you. much, Speaker. Supplementary. Oh, he was good. S -s -s Speaker, it's this government and minister that failed to ensure we're getting the services that we're actually paying for. Visit any one of these centres, Speaker, and you'll see long, winding lines and camp-out queues of young and old waiting hours or even days to book and take a test that they require them to drive here in the province of Ontario. The cost of time off work, stress and frustration is mounting while driving school instructors I met with from the minister's own riding say his inaction has left their students in costly drive test gridlock. Speaker, the contract with Circle provides the government auditing, performance, penalty and warning notice powers. As the wait times continue to grow, will the minister tell us when he will deliver those penalties and Question. warnings to end the drive test gridlock we're all at end more and more for here in the province? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, Speaker. I appreciate the member's second question on this uh, particular topic. As I said in my original answer, I anticipate that I'll have an update that can be provided publicly in the next number of weeks. Uh, and in the meantime, I will, I will say to people that are, that are using our drive test centres uh, that we uh, are aware that in some of those centres there's a bit of an ongoing challenge. We're going to keep working hard to resolve that challenge. And I look forward to providing that update and receiving support from that member when that update comes. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thank you. Time for question period has ended. We have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 163, an act to enact the Safe Access to Abortion Services Act 2017, and to amend the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act in relation to abortion services. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
All members, please take your seats. October the 16th, 2017, Ms. Nerdo Harris moved second reading of Bill 163, an act to enact the Safe Access to Abortion Services Act 2017, and to amend the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act in relation to abortion services. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack, Mr. Nack, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Sandals, Mr. Sandals, Mr. Sandals, Mr. Susan, Mr. Susan, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Matthews, Ms. Matthews, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Dugan, Mr. Dugan, Mr. McCharles, Mr. McCharles, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. Takar, Mr. Takar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerle. Ms. Domerle. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Reneal. Ms. Reneal. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoke. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoke. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelen. Madame Jelen. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. The ayes are 85, the nays are 1. The ayes being 85 and the nays being 1, I declare the motion carried. Pursuant to the order of the House dated October 16, 2017, the bill is referred to the Standing Committee on General Government. The member from London, Fanshawe, on a point of order. Speaker, I'd like to welcome some special guests here today from the Co-op Housing Federation. Mary Ann Hannett, Simone Swale, Denise. McGacken, Jacob LaRock Graham. Welcome to the Legislature. Thank you. The Minister of Innovation, Science and Research. Mr. Speaker, uh, please join me in welcoming Brother Aslam Badat visiting the House today. And on this very occasion, they, uh, as you know, Mr. Speaker, October is the Islamic Heritage Month, and the scholars from India, Islamic community of India, they are visiting the House as well. Oh. So welcome all. Thank you. Thank you. We welcome our guests. Uh, there being no further deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 2 p.m. this after 3 p.m. this afternoon. Let's go over.